Hello and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's live online webinar and book launch, Creating an Image Story with Food with Lauren Short, author and photographer behind our newly released publication, The Complete Guide to Food Photography. We're going to be getting started in just a minute to give participants some time to enter. In the meantime, please feel free to share with us in chat your name and where you're tuning in from. Welcome everyone, if you've just joined us and you're here for our live online webinar, Creating an Image Story with Food with Lauren Short, you've come to the right place. We will be getting started in just a minute. Uh, while we wait for attendees to join, please feel free to share with us your name and where you're tuning in from. Looks like we have a really great international presence, which is really exciting to see. Welcome everyone. All right, we may have um, some more participants who will be joining us in progress, but we're going to get started with introductions. A couple of things to note. If you have to leave early for whatever reason, we will be recording this webinar and emailing all those who registered to watch this replay. If you have any questions during the tutorial or the sharing that web, uh, Lauren is sharing, please enter those into the Q&A function. Um, we will be having a 10 to 15 minute Q&A at the end of the webinar. Um, to introduce myself, I am Katie Walker. I am the marketing coordinator at Rocky Nook and it is my pleasure to welcome you. Today we have more than 90 people registered for this event. So for those of you who are new to Rocky Nook, uh, we are a small independent publisher local to the Bay Area and were founded in 2006 with the goal of helping all level photographers improve their skills to capture those moments that matter. Recently, we have taken our passion for creativity and of making finely crafted books and started applying it to other artistic endeavors, namely publishing books on drawing, painting, graphic design, crafts, and much more. We are delighted to welcome Lauren Short as we promote and celebrate her new book, The Complete Guide to Food Photography, um, which is out and available now and which I will be sharing links in the chat to purchase uh, with a discount that you can use at checkout. We ask that if you buy Lauren's book that you leave her a review online as this helps both us as the publisher, but really it helps Lauren as the photographer, author, and instructor. Lauren Short, as a British photographer living in Zurich, Switzerland, where she lives with her husband. Back in 2015, she made a U-turn from her career in tax to pursue her passion and become a full-time photographer. Lauren specializes in food photography and she works with clients in a range of styles from product to restaurants to editorial. In addition, Lauren runs the food photography education membership, Food Photography Academy, as well as a blog and YouTube channel. She is passionate about sharing everything she knows with other photographers to help them develop their skills and gain a deeper understanding of photography. Please join me in welcoming Lauren Short. Hi, everyone. All right, well, thank you so much for having me today. I'm really excited to be here to share this presentation with you. Um, I hope that you'll learn a few useful tips along the way and I'll pop in at the end to tell you a little bit more about the book as well. So to get started, I'm gonna start sharing my screen and turn my video off so we can just jump right into it. Okay. Let me hide myself. There we go. So this webinar today is going to focus all about my 
kind of formula for creating an image story with food. So before we jump in, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, like Katie said, I'm a British food photographer living in Zurich, Switzerland. We moved here about eight and a half years ago, <clears throat> and I've been um, doing food photography full time for about seven years now. Um, and then I started teaching online a few years after that. Um, I've recently released my book, The Complete Guide to Food Photography with Rocky Nook, which we're all really excited about. I'm also the founder and creator of Food Photography Academy, which is an online membership site for food photographers who basically want to learn the foundations of everything to do with food photography. So we have courses on editing, composition, there's a lighting course coming, all that good stuff. And I'm also a YouTuber and an online educator. So if you want to check out any of my free content, you can search for Lauren Carishaw on YouTube and my channel should come up. So today we're going to be looking at all of the things that I like to think about when I'm building a food story. So food images are made up of different elements, all of which are important for telling a story. And all of these things need to work together to bring your vision to life. We can't just take one thing on its own, like lighting or composition or styling and expect to come out with a great image. So in this webinar, we're going to go step by step through the four elements that I always think about when I'm planning an image or an image series. And those are light. So the lighting that I'm going to use, the composition, the backdrops and props that I'm going to use, and also the styling. So all of these things together are what make a great food image. So let's jump straight in to lighting. So for me, lighting is the most fundamental aspect of a photo. It's why I made it chapter one in my book. Um, it's always what I consider first when I'm planning an image. The light that you use um, is going to completely change the feel of your photo, whether you're going for a light and bright look or a dark and moody look. If you have a lighting setup that doesn't really reflect the story you're going to try and tell, then it can completely ruin your photo. Whereas a good lighting can really enhance a story. And it's almost, I think, the thing that sets the most mood in an image. So not only is good lighting important for a technically good photo, it is also going to set that mood as well. So one of the things that I think is really helpful to understand is the, the few principles of light and how it behaves, because light isn't really just one thing. We have a light source, but the way light behaves depends on a few different factors. And when you understand all of these things and you put them together, you can make much more informed decisions about the lighting that you're going to use in your image as well. So the first one might seem quite obvious, um, and that is the brightness of the light. And this isn't always just about turning the brightness of your light up and down if you're using artificial light or the time of day you're shooting if you're shooting in natural light, but it's actually controlled by two things, and those are distance and power. So if we take artificial light as an example, because it's a little bit easier to visualize, um, you can imagine that if you had a speed light in a softbox and you had it on half power, and then you take the same image again, but you turn the speed light up to full power, obviously you're expecting that the image is going to get brighter because you've increased the power of the light. And then the next thing we could do is if we have the same speed light in the same softbox on half power and we take an image and then we move that softbox closer to the subject and then take another image, the image is also going to appear brighter because the light source is closer to the subject. So those two things together are going to affect the brightness of your light. So if you're shooting in natural light and you're using a window, the closer you are to that window, the brighter the light is going to appear. So that's the first principle of light to be aware of. The next one is contrast. So contrast, again, is controlled by two things, and that is the size of your light source and the proximity of your light source to your subject. 
So a small light source creates a higher contrast light. Now, when we think of a small light source, you might think of something like a light bulb or even a bear, the bare bulb of a speed light. But actually, even the sun is a small light source, even though it's absolutely massive. It's so far away that it appears small relative to the earth. So whenever we're shooting a subject in undiffused natural sunlight, it's essentially acting as if it's a very, very small light source, which is going to give um, our subject, uh, the shadows that our subject creates a much harder appearance. So if we just take a quick look at these two images on the right, the one on the left has been shot with a diffused light source. So essentially making that light source bigger and the shadows that you see are much softer. They have a nice gradient from the shadow to the highlight. Whereas the photo on the right has been shot with an undiffused light source. So a much smaller light source. And that has created very hard edge shadows where there's a very clear line where the shadow ends and where the, the um, highlight begins. So that's another thing that you can think about when you're choosing your lighting. <clears throat> the next thing to be aware of is color. So all light has a color temperature and this is measured in a scale that we call the Kelvin scale. And it ranges from warm to cool. So white daylight balanced light or light that we perceive as not having a color cast of yellow or blue sits right in the middle of the scale at 5,500 Kelvins. <clears throat> Typically, when we're shooting food, we do tend to want to keep the light daylight balanced in the middle because we're not always trying to go super creative with the colors of in food. We want them to look as realistic as possible. That's not to say that there's never um, a good opportunity to shoot the slightly different colored light, but generally we want to keep things looking real <laughs> so that our food looks appealing. So when you're shooting an artificial light, this is quite simple because normally you know what the color temperature of your light is. And most speed lights and flashes and all of that kind of stuff come daylight balance. So you know that the light coming out of them is pretty, pretty white already. But if you're shooting in natural light, I would recommend either playing around with the Kelvin value of your white balance a bit, or even going ahead and setting a custom white balance rather than just using the auto white balance mode. Sometimes when you're shooting food, the auto white balance function can get a little bit confused. A lot of food is quite yellow toned if you're shooting something like a cake or bread. So it can sort of incorrectly think that the whole scene is yellow because of the lighting, whereas in fact, it's actually the subject that's yellow and it can set something too cool. So that's just something to be aware of when you're working with a white balance. Okay, next we have the direction. So this is something that we can very much control as, as photographers. So the direction that the light is coming from in an image can create a completely different atmosphere. When we're working with food, normally, um, well, the main lighting directions that we might work with would be side light, backlight, top light, and front light. But most of the time in food, we're gonna be using side light or backlight. So you can see from these two diagrams on the left, we've got an example of a side light setup where basically the light is to the right or the left of the camera at somewhere around 90 degrees. It doesn't have to be exactly 90 degrees. It can sort of be a range around that side and sometimes going slightly off center to the side can help. Um, and then on the right, we've got an example of the backlight where essentially the light is facing the camera lens. So you're shooting into the light with your subject in the middle. So let's have a look at a couple of examples of this. So side light, um, typically when you're working with diffuse side light, it creates a soft, even feel that works for most types of food photography and camera angles as well. So here we've got an example of a top down flat lay image and also a 45 degree angle macro shot. 
So when I'm shooting with side light, I do like to take the light off on a slight diagonal to help emphasize specular highlights. So particularly in the cupcake image on the right, you can see that the shadows aren't quite perfectly pointing towards the right. They come forward ever so slightly. And what that's allowed me to create is really nice little specular highlights on the white berries on top of the main cupcake. So those are actually direct reflections of my softbox, but I feel like it adds a lot to the shape of the berries and it just gives the image a bit more dimension. So that's something that you can think about when you're using side light. Next, we have backlight. So backlight lighting gives images a bit more of an ethereal feel and a lot of character. It is slightly more tricky technically to work with, but it's certainly not impossible. Um, you might need to think about whether you want to fill in some of the shadows on the front with a white bounce card or a reflector. So for example, on the image on the right, where this I was shooting in a big opaque black bowl, I did actually use a reflector on the front. You can't necessarily tell very much because the shadow does still look very dark, but without it, that part of the image was completely clipped out. So just adding a little white card allowed me to lift a little bit of the shadow so you can still see the backdrop in the front. And then on the image on the left, I didn't use any kind of fill because the subject, which is a glass with a translucent liquid in it, allows the light to pass through it directly. So I was able to get a really good exposure overall without using any fill. So typically for me, I find backlight works best on 45 degree angle shots, which is what both of these are. It can work on a straight on shot, depending on what your subject is. But I find when you use a 45 degree angle and you can still see a bit of that direct specular reflection on the surface of your food, that's a really nice effect for backlighting. Okay, so that's sort of all of the principles that I like to think about. And the next one that my last lighting point is about manipulating light. So you've got a light source, whether that's an artificial softbox or something else or a window, and that's just giving you sort of a straight amount of light coming out of it. And sometimes that's fine, but sometimes we need to play with it a little bit more. So in this image, I used a single light source from the, uh, from the left, which if you look at the image on the right, I've sort of made a little diagram of my setup. And then in the video on the left, uh, which I will start playing, you can see it's just going to loop around um, what adding each of these different things added to the scene. So I started with my softbox and then I added a black background. So this was actually just a fill card. And then I added a negative fill card directly opposite the light source to really deepen the shadows to the right of the bowl of olives and all of that. And then I used another black fill card to create a bit of a flag at the back. So what you can see the flag is doing is it's screening off the back part of my scene. So the light from the softbox is not falling on that part, which just really allows it to look a bit deeper. It helps my subject stand out more. Um, and just gives the image a bit more focus. Okay, so those are all the things that I like to think about with lighting. Now, the next thing that I always think about is composition. So food photography in itself is a form of still life art. Our subject hopefully isn't running around <laughs> most of the time. We can't direct it to smile or frown or look a certain way we have to set everything up as the photographer. Um, and just like any other kind of, of photography, we can employ different artistic principles to help with placement and arrangement in a scene. So before I even walk on set to start a shoot, I like to think about which composition technique I'm going to use and make a little sketch on a template to think about where my hero subject and any supporting subjects will go. What this does is it helps me to walk into my shoot with a vision so I don't have that blank canvas feeling on set. Now, some people 
really like to walk in uh, with that blank canvas and just kind of see what happens and naturally build a scene. And that is completely fine. Um, but I find it really helpful to think about the composition technique that might work well for my image first and have a little bit of an idea of what I want to start with when I go in so that I can play around with things from a starting point rather from that blank backdrop. So let's have a little chat about composition techniques. So these are my five go-to composition techniques that I'm always using for food photography. And I find that they're all good for different things. So let's start with the golden spiral. So the golden spiral is quite a scientific one and the sort of technical brain in me really enjoys learning about how these techniques are formed. So if you are interested in that, I would recommend that you go and look up how this is linked to the Fibonacci sequence afterwards. It is fascinating um, and it's very interesting. So, but I'm not gonna go into all of that right now. So this technique creates this really soft, infinite spiral that is really great for soft, gentle images. So I often use this when I'm working with warm, analogous colors, um, lots of negative space, maybe some cloths or slightly busier scenes where I've got lots of subjects to place. It's also a really good one if you need to leave negative space in an image, which you might if um, you're working with a client and they want an image that specifically has some space on it for some text or something like that. So yeah, it's a really soft, flowy technique, very good with round subjects. Okay, the next one is the phi grid. So this is also one of the golden principles. So this is sometimes also known as the golden ratio. Um, this is a slightly more angular technique than the golden spiral. And it's great for positioning subjects that have um, horizons and objects with strong lines, like say a champagne glass or some kind of cocktail glass that has a stem. When, you, when I'm talking about horizons in food photography, what I mean is if you have a baseboard and a background and you're shooting either straight on or at 45 degrees, it's where you're going to place that line of where the baseboard and the background meet. So generally we don't want to have that right in the middle of the frame because it looks, it, it works sometimes, but most of the time it looks a little bit too sort of cut and having it either on that top or bottom line can be a really good way to just easily get a nice feeling of balance in the frame. So the next one is the rule of thirds. This works very similarly to the golden ratio um, or the phi grid. It's just a little bit more basic. Um, so again, I would do the same thing with the lines if I had horizons in my images. And then I would focus on placing my main subjects on the intersections. So wherever those lines cross, those are the strongest points of the frame. And that is the same for all of these composition techniques. Wherever lines meet, those are your strong points. So that would be my starting point for where my main subject is going to go. Okay, next we have the golden triangle. And this is probably my personal favorite one and the one that I end up using the most. I just find it's very flexible. It's great for adding movement and dynamic tension to images. It gives you a lot of diagonals to work with. And when you have opposing diagonals in a frame, it, it just helps to add a bit of movement rather than having everything facing in the same direction. And then the dynamic symmetry grid is a more advanced version of the golden triangle. Um, it's maybe a bit difficult to see on this grid, but it's actually two golden triangles back to back. So essentially it's using all of the same techniques from the golden triangle, just multiplied. <laughs> so this technique is great if you've got a scene where there's a lot of lines going on. So maybe you've got lots of plates and each one has got a fork on it, or you've got some boards and utensils and things, then the dynamic symmetry grid is really helpful for positioning those lines. Okay, so let's take a look at an example, and this is a golden triangle example. So what I normally do is 
begin by sketching out a rough draft of my image on a template that I print so that I can plan the angle and the positioning of my subjects. So things that I pay attention to when I'm planning my composition would be the camera angle. So whether I'm going for a straight on zero degree, a 45 degree or a 90 degree flat lay. And this will depend on what I'm shooting. Some subjects just lend themselves very naturally to one angle. So say you're shooting a pizza, that's definitely most of the time gonna be a flat lay 90 degree. But if you're shooting a soup, it's probably also gonna be a 90 degree. If you're shooting a drink, it's probably gonna be a zero or a 45 degree. So you have to think about the subject and which camera angle is gonna work best. Next, I think about the direction of the light, any supporting props or you know utensils, anything that I might use and any garnishes. So I like to shoot my scenes on a tripod but also kind of just have a bit of time exploring my scene freehand first, because sometimes even though, <clears throat> even though I've planned a scene, something different might just work better once I'm there. But as I said, I like going in with a plan. So in this image, what I've done is I've placed the main bowl, which is the one at the top, right on that intersection where the gray cross is. The second bowl is also on the main line, but I've ever so slightly cropped it out just to make it a little bit more obvious that the first one is the main one and that the other bowl is secondary. I then placed two supporting props on the bisectional line. So that's the line that goes from the bottom left corner up to the line and the top right corner down to the line. And then you can see a few little gray arrows where I've used those lines to place things like my teaspoon and the fig in the top bowl as well. Now, as you can see, I have got a couple of other things in the frame that aren't exactly falling on the grid and that is completely okay. The grids I find work best when you use them to position the main things in your frame, but you don't necessarily want every single thing to completely fall within the rules of that grid because things can start to look a little bit too uh, regimented or too perfect very quickly. And we still want things to look natural. So I really enjoy using these as a starting point, but not sticking too closely that you can't stray at all. So here's a few of my real life sketches that I did and the resulting images. Um, you can see the top right one, I've used the phi grid and that horizon is sitting along the top uh, horizontal line. Um, in the top right image, we've got the rule of thirds where I've just kind of used the top two thirds and the bottom two third and the bottom third, sorry, to separate the subjects. Um, we've got the dynamic symmetry grid on the bottom left. This is a good example of one of those images where there's a lot of lines going on. I've got the board, the knife, the pastry cutter, strips of pastry, etc. So that was a really helpful technique for um, for positioning those things. And then on the bottom right, we've got another golden triangle example. So this is something that I do tend to do for most shoots that I do. But as I said, I also do take time to explore freehand. So if you prefer doing that, that's completely fine. But this is something that I have found has really helped me. Okay, the next thing is backdrops and props, maybe one of the more fun parts of putting a shoot together. So when I'm looking at backdrops, I have found over the years that investing in good quality surfaces to use in your food photography is one of the best investments you can make to improve your images. Sometimes it can be a bit eye-watering to look at the cost of some of the boards and backdrops that you can buy for food photography. But when I have invested in a really good quality surface, they have lasted me basically infinitely. As long as you look after them and you wipe them carefully after every shoot, you're going to get a lot of good use out of them. And there really is nothing quite like a real texture. With that being said, my go-to materials for backdrops are vinyl, wood, painted, and canvas. 
So with final backdrops, again, there's a real range in quality out there. Um, so you want to make sure that you're getting one that is made from a good material that's going to lie flat, that isn't too shiny, so it's not going to give off loads of glare. And then if you get a good quality vinyl, it can really last you a long time and look very, very real. And then recently, I've been really enjoying shooting on canvas backdrops as well. So these are painted canvases, typically in sort of that mottled color. And those are really great for being completely matte, for creating seamless backdrops where you want to just drape it from the back to the front. They're very flexible and very different to anything else out there as well. So the majority of the time with food photography, neutral colored surfaces are the way to go um, as they will work with almost any food. So if you're just starting out and you're looking to buy a few backdrops to get you started, I would definitely recommend going with a neutral set, something cool, something warm, something gray maybe, but nothing too bright if you're just starting. And then as you progress, you should have the flexibility as well to create some light and dark shots. So make sure that you do have a couple of light and dark ones in there as well. And like I said, that is great for getting started. But as you go on, don't be afraid to push the boundaries with unexpected colors. I held back with color for so long. Um, and it's something that I regret not doing sooner because shooting on bright colors can be intimidating, but it can also be really fun and it can really bring certain images to life. So you can, let's have a look at color theory to see how you compare backdrops and foods together. So there are lots of different ways to use the color theory wheel, but we're going to look at the two ways that I like to use it the most often for food photography. So first off, we've got the analogous color palette. So what analogous means is colors that sit next to each other on the color wheel. So in the example on the left, you can see we've got yellow, orange, and then sort of just heading into red. That's one example of an analogous palette. And then on the right, we've got an example of green into blue. And that's another example of an analogous palette. So any colors that sit next to each other on the wheel go together really well. So if you're shooting food of a certain color, you might want to think about whether you want to use backdrops or props in the same kind of color palette to keep things a bit more monochromatic. Alternatively, uh, we can do the complete opposite and go with complementary colors. So complementary colors sit opposite each other on the color wheel. So on the left, we've got a orange, yellow, and then a blue. And then on the right, we've got a yellow, green, and a purple. So this is a really good way to make your food really pop. So yeah, if you're shooting something blue, like, I don't know, a blueberry pie, maybe using a yellow or orange background can really make it stand out. You can really have a lot of fun with color palettes. And this is something that I like to think of with garnishes as well. Typically complement, yeah, complementary colored garnishes work really well. So let's have a look at this example. So in this image, the predominant colors are dyad colors, which means they're not directly next to each other, but they are closely related on the color wheel. So they probably have one space in between them. In the background, I wanted to keep the warmth from the warm soup broth. So I chose a brown toned background with a little bit of texture. Now this background is actually a vinyl background, but it's a really nice quality. So it's not reflecting light and the texture looks very realistic. I used black bowls for my props to keep that dark and moody feel going and provide a bit of contrast from the soup itself where we've got a lot of bright ingredients going on. So I really wanted those noodles and all of the toppings to really just pop out and the black bowls really helped me do that. You can see on the left how I spent a bit of time mapping out my scene with the props first just to make sure that I liked the look of everything including the lighting, the composition, 
the props and backgrounds all together before I brought the food in so that the food is not sitting on set for too long, wilting away. And that's another tip for a good composition. Okay, so let's have a look at what I think about when I'm putting together props and backdrops. So the first and probably the most important thing to think about is what is the food? Think about what colors and textures are already present in the food you're going to be shooting. You don't want to pick props and backdrops that are going to clash with the food or make it get lost. So keep color theory in mind when you're thinking about that. Uh, yes, as I said, color theory. So decide on which color palette will be best served in the image that you're creating, because this is going to have a huge impact on the overall feel of the image. If you want something where your subject's going to stand out, then an analogous palette is probably not the best choice. And you might want to go with complementary instead. And then lastly, with props, I like to only use props that are necessary to tell the story in your image. Don't overwhelm the food, but use colors and textures that complement the scene. So that's not in any way saying that you can't shoot a busy scene with lots of props, but I don't like to add things in just because I think it's pretty or I think it's a nice bowl. It has to fit with the story or what I'm trying to shoot to make sense. Okay, so let's move on to the next thing, which is styling. So I find there's a common misconception, particularly among new food photographers, that being a food photographer automatically makes you a food stylist, when in fact, they are two distinctly different jobs with different skill sets that work together to create great images. When you're food styling, you need to switch your mindset from chef to stylist. <clears throat> and if you have ever worked with a food stylist on set, then you will know that the way that things are cooked is a bit different than the way you would necessarily cook them at home. And while 95% of the time I'd say we are shooting real food, it's not always prepared in the most edible way, which can take a bit of getting used to as we learn new techniques. So one of the first things that people always say to me when they find out what I do is, oh, do you pour motor oil all over pancakes or use mashed potato for ice cream? And most of the time, the answer to that question is no. But I sort of think, well, if I was cooking roasted vegetables for a photo shoot, I'm probably not going to roast them all the way that I would if we if I was preparing them to serve for dinner, because I don't want them to look too wrinkly and overdone on set. So yeah, it's a bit in the middle. So here are my food styling top tips, which I think are important to bear in mind as a food photographer. We don't need to be food stylists, but having some kind of food styling knowledge is important. So the first thing is to shop for quality. So when you're shopping for your food shoot, make sure you're looking for good quality things. You don't want to end up with herbs that look a bit wilted or a bit brown or a bit crushed. So just make sure that you're looking out for things that are going to translate well in a photo. The next tip is to always have more than you think you'll need. You never know when you might need to reshoot something or something might just get cut too small. Sometimes accidents happen and things get dropped. And it, it, there is nothing worse than not having any more on set ready to go. So always have a bit more produce on hand than you think you're going to need. The next one is to build your scene slowly and intentionally. This is not the time to rush getting it together. And sometimes it can feel a bit unnatural to really slowly and intentionally put together a plate of food, but it is worth it when you're styling. The next thing is to not make it too perfect. Um, obviously, there are exceptions if you're shooting in a Michelin star restaurant, but then the chef is probably doing the food preparation anyway. But most of the time, we want things to still look natural and not having things looking too perfect helps with that. 
And then lastly, it's to find the hero side. So <clears throat> if you've got a cupcake, spend a bit of time spinning it around and see where the frosting looks the best. Or, you know, if you've got a burger, find the side where the ingredients look the best and just play around with making sure that you're shooting the best in your food. So here we have my little recommended food styling toolkit. Now you definitely don't need all of these things if you're just starting out, but these are relatively inexpensive tools that I find have really, really helped me with my food styling. So I'm just gonna go through in order from one to 11. So one and two, I've just got two knives. Number one is a chef's knife and number two is a paring knife. What's really important when you're working with any kind of knife is that they are sharp. So I would probably add a knife sharpener to this as well. There is nothing worse and probably more dangerous than trying to chop things with blunt knives. Not only is it going to increase the risk of accidents, but you're not going to have the same kind of control or precision that you have with a nice sharp knife. Number three is a couple of tweezers. I have a straight pair and a pair with an offset end. And those are really great for placing fiddly little things like maybe little microgreens or, you know, small seeds or anything on set. Particularly things that I don't want to touch too much to not transfer heat from my hands. So with herbs, I like to not handle them as much as possible because anytime I touch it with my finger, the heat from that is going to speed up that wilting process. So the tweezers just help things last a little bit longer. Number four is just a set of small paintbrushes. These are literally basic paintbrushes from a craft store. Um, I use these for brushing oil onto things like vegetables or steaks, edges of burgers. They're really great for a bit of precision and just really handy. Number five is some kind of putty or blue tack that you can just use to keep rogue things in place. This can come in really useful if you've got a napkin that doesn't want to stay in the right place or, you know, anything like that. Spoons that aren't playing ball, a bit of putty nine times out of 10 will solve the problem. Number six is a little chef's blow torch. This is not an expensive one at all. It just allows you to add specific char or, you know, heat onto a very precise area. So if I'm working with a meringue or anything like that, this is going to allow me to get that really nice crispy feel. Number seven is a set of cocktail sticks. These are great for building sandwiches, burgers, anything with a lot of layers where you want things to stay in place, even stacks of pancakes where you want things to be nice and tall, but not wonky. Number eight is some cotton buds. These are just great for cleanups, any little drips where, you know, getting a cloth in there might be a bit too much. They're really helpful. Number nine is a little pair of herb scissors. So these are actually a very small pair of garden shears and they're really great for cutting stems. They're very sharp um, and they're also very small so I can be very precise. <clears throat> Number 10 is a pastry brush. So quite obviously I use this for brushing onto pastry, making sure that I egg wash it before I bake it so it looks nice. And number 11 is some makeup sponges. You can buy these in all kinds of shapes and sizes. And if you chop chunks off them, depending on what you need, they can be really helpful for propping things up that don't want to stay up. Okay, so as you're building a scene, this is what I mean by working layers. So let's have a look at this example. So this salad is going to turn into a parma ham and fig salad with lots of things going on. So to start with, I just placed the melon slices and then I added the rocket. So I really spent quite a lot of time placing these melon slices on the plate and I made sure that I had them going in different directions. I've got one go laying on its side to give a different perspective. Some have some seeds, some don't. Um, yeah, it just, it really helps to take a bit of time to do that. And then with the rocket, 
by putting that on second, I was able to choose where I wanted some rocket to fall on top of the melon and where I wanted to tuck some underneath. So it looks natural, but it actually took a bit of time. Next, I added the Parma ham in some nice little ruffles. And again, I could play around with tucking some underneath melon slices, putting some on top, um, and then tearing the burrata balls and the figs to dot around the salad as well. Next, I added some olive oil, honey, and pepper. And this just added another layer of interest, but also, you know, it's what would actually be on the salad. But I could really sort of precisely put it where I wanted. So I mostly focused the pepper on the burrata balls and on the melon slices, because that's where you can see it the most. And then I made sure that I got a nice little drizzle of that dressing on top of the burrata as well, because again, you can really see it against the white of the cheese. And then lastly, we added a few herbs and microgreens to the top of the salad. So all in all, there's probably one, two, three, four, five, six, about seven layers to this salad. And it, we did spend quite a long time building it. And to get to that final sort of natural looking result, it wasn't a case of just mixing everything together and throwing it on a plate. It was very intentionally built. So make sure you spend a bit of time doing that. Okay, so that's sort of all of the things that I think of. So let's just have a quick look at a multi-image story. So this is something else that I love to do is to create images that go together. So when I'm creating multi-image stories, I like to make sure that the images are quite different. So they're not necessarily just two different angles of the same thing, but they clearly are related and work together. So normally I'll plan that my main image with my hero subject is gonna go in the middle and it's gonna be framed by two different parts of the story. So for this pumpkin pie, I had the raw pumpkin on the left and I chose a really dark green backdrop for this because it's very different to the, the finished pie image. And then on the right, I wanted to include a macro shot of the cinnamon sticks to accentuate the kind of flavors that you're going to find in the pie as well. So when you're creating these kinds of images, think about what could go together that's going to complement each other, but also work together for your story. Okay, so that brings us to the end of sort of the main part of the webinar. So I just wanted to take a second to just tell you a little bit more about the book and then also give you a little sneak peek of some of the video that you get with the book as well. So the first chapters of the book take us in detail into each of the core principles needed for food photography. So we go through lighting, composition, styling, crafting a story and editing. All of these things are really important on their own as we've just looked at with some of them. There's a lot to learn for each one. So I really wanted to devote an entire chapter to each of these topics and really go in depth to give you as much information as possible. But like I mentioned, it's more about how all of those things come together to make a great image than knowing about them on their own. So in the second part of the book, I take you through eight case study shoots with over four hours of live shoot footage. So each of the case studies is written up in the book. And there's also a link where you can watch the full behind the scenes shoot from the lighting setup, the composition, the styling, the shooting and the editing to show you how I bring everything together in different styles. <clears throat> so with that being said, um, I've put together a little five minute preview of one of the case studies. Each one is about 30 to 40 minutes. So I've just given you a, li a little preview here. Um, so let's have a look at that. With the caramel drizzle, as you can see, even as I'm standing here talking, it's it's kind of drizzling down a bit. As soon as we'd finished styling this, we'd have the caramel drizzle, the pecans and the toffee pieces on. 
we got that shot so that we knew we had that in the bag before it started to dribble down the sides a little bit too much. But with the caramel drizzle, again, it was just about putting it in all the different sort of crevices. There's a few drops that are a bit dark, uh, deeper, so the, it, the color looks a bit richer there. And then just making sure that everything is visible on the front side of the cake where it's gonna be shot. Um, for the supporting bowl, we went for pecans. We thought about doing the toffee pieces, but as you can see, they're, they're quite light in color. The pecans are a little bit richer, they have a bit more texture, and they're still a very prominent feature of the decoration. So having a bowl of pecans there was able to kind of tie those elements together. So, um, oh, last thing with the lighting, actually, I forgot to mention, I added a flag next to the softbox. So what that's doing is just stopping any of this light coming from this softbox from spilling onto the background. And then in the actual backdrop of the image, you can see that it creates a nice soft line where the light radiates from light to dark. Okay, so then we're gonna bring in the caramel. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change my camera into continuous burst mode, and I'm gonna choose the medium speed. And then as I'm shooting, I'm gonna hold down the shutter. And as Izzy's drizzling, she can kind of go nuts with the spoon um, and we can capture lots of images together so we can pick the best one. Um, part of the reason we do this at the end after we've got the shot is this cake is probably gonna look pretty covered by the time we finish. So it's definitely not gonna look exactly how we want. So then we can pick that best sort of swizzle and comp it onto the cake shot that we like the best. So I'm keeping the camera exactly in the same place. Um, yeah, so I think if you grab like a decent spoon and kind of just maybe move it a little bit side to side, it would be nice to try and get a stream that's got a bit of movement. Um, yeah. So if you just start when you're ready, I'll, I'll just start shooting. And keep going. <laughs> I think you could even go a little bit more, more extreme. Yeah, because it, I mean, it looks, let me just check the, yeah, I think because it's quite a thick source. Cool. All right, let's go again. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. more drizzle yeah we can definitely try that to let these load should I would it help if I put the focus backwards a little bit I think maybe that would be a bit easier yeah maybe yeah so maybe if you put where you think you feel most comfortable yeah, so let me. Yeah, exactly. Perfect. All right. Let these look really good. Yeah, these are really, and with that focus, like really, but you get a really nice specular highlight. And actually another thing that's really nice about this modifier when you're doing this kind of thing where you've got a spoon, because of the shape of the modifier, where you're seeing a direct reflection of it in the spoon, um, which is that sort of rectangle, it is rectangular. Because if we had a circle, it would look a little bit strange, but it kind of follows the contour of the spoon and the drizzle really nicely. So I definitely think in one of these, we've got a really good drizzle that we can comp in. So let's head in to the edit. I'll show you how I'm gonna process these in Lightroom first and then pull everything together in Photoshop. All right, so that kind of brings us to the end of the teaching part. And now I think we're gonna have a bit of Q&A time. That's right. Um, it's Q&A. Um, thank you so much, Lauren. I, I mean, I started watching that video and I was like, I want to see what happens in the edit. <laughs> <laughs> it's really enrapturing. Um, yeah, so we have a couple of questions in the Q&A. 
But um, before we get started, I wanted to ask my question, which sure. showing off of the book. And so you have this in the slideshow and this is the book for everybody to see. It is gorgeous. Um, it really, we just, we did a really great job. Lauren did a really great job and we're all so proud of it. It's a great book. And I hope um, those of you who haven't ordered it yet that you can. And for those of you who are still waiting on your copy to be shipped, I'm excited for you to get this. Um, my question is, did you choose the cover image? Because I noticed that it is the golden spiral. And yes. yes. Okay. Did you choose this to be the cover image or was that a design choice from one of the designers? Um, I think it was mutual actually. So I sent over about eight images that we, I thought possibly could be cover contenders. Um, and then you guys did an amazing job sort of putting each of them into a proposed cover. And I think we all agreed that this image looked the best. <laughs> um, I really loved that color palette. It, when I first got contacted and was thinking about the book, I sort of had this idea that I wanted something kind of reddish. Um, so yeah, I think it just worked out really, really well. Yeah, yeah, it did. It turned out great. Um, so let's get to the audience's question now that we had my yeah. question out of the way. Um, let's see. Phil was curious about the size of the softbox that you use for your photo shoots. Yeah, great question. Um, it depends. <laughs> probably the most annoying answer ever. The ones that I use the most often are a 120 centimeter octagonal softbox. I find that's a really good one for side light or bigger scenes. I also have a 60 by 90 centimeter rectangular softbox and I use that most of the time for drinks. Um, when you're shooting drinks, if you have any kind of direct reflections sort of like specular highlights, where you might see the light source in the side of the glass, going for something more rectangular rather than round is just a bit more flattering. And then the last one that I use the most often is the one by four, which is the one that you just saw in the caramel drizzle cake example. So that's my strip soft box. It's very thin and tall, and it's great for creating really direct light or shooting a darker moody scene where I want the light really concentrated in one place. Great, thank you for that. Um, Julie, who has a couple of questions, asks, how do you obtain a diagonal when side lighting an image? Sorry, could you repeat that last bit? How do you obtain a diagonal when side lighting an image? Oh, right, yeah. So it's side light, it's all relative to where your camera is. So um, if you've got your camera here and your light here, it would just be about sort of angling the light a little bit towards the front or towards the back. I don't make it too dramatic when I do it, but I do find it makes things a little bit more interesting. And I normally go more towards the back. So if you're working with natural light, it's about moving yourself so that the window is relative to the camera at a slight diagonal to the side. Um, and then with artificial light, you can obviously move your light source around. So I hope that makes sense. I'm not a photographer, but I think it made sense to me. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, another question, do all of the outlays work for all of the camera angles or are they more for flat lays? Oh no, they definitely work for all camera angles. Um, so when I'm shooting, particularly with the golden, tri uh, sorry, the golden ratio or the rule of thirds, and I'm talking about horizons, that's really for those straight on or 45 degree angle shots, but all of the techniques can be used at any camera angle. So when I'm thinking about planning and if I'm sketching, I sort of build in that perspective to images as well. So yeah, definitely not just flat lace. Great. Um, Julie asks about food styling. What does a food stylist do over and above what you would do as a photographer? So what a food stylist does if they're working on set with you is they will buy all the ingredients, um, cook the food and do all of the plating and styling. So really they're in charge of the food. Um, what I find beneficial about that as a food photographer is particularly on a client job, 
when maybe the client is there as well, you can really just focus on being the photographer, which really means thinking about the lighting, the composition and the actual shooting. And then the food stylist is going to do what they do best, which is making the food look good. So like I mentioned, as a food photographer, I think it is important to have a basic level of food styling or, you know, even maybe more than a basic level. A lot of food photographers will work as a food stylist as well. Um, But where possible, I like to work with a food stylist on a client shoot because then I think everyone on set is playing to their strengths. You all get to focus on what you do best and normally the images come out better for it. Right. Um, we have one more question, but before I ask that question, I just wanted to say, read some of the praise that you've gotten in the chat. Um, Carrie says, I love in the book how it feels like you are in the studio with Lauren. Jody, oh. Jody says, no question, just wanted to say how awesome this is. I bought the book an hour ago. Oh, that's so cool. Thank you. Carrie also adds, thank you so much, Lauren. This book is a lovely on-hand resource to keep in my studio. Um, oh yeah, that's that's definitely what I imagine for the book is I would love people to have it with them in the studio while they're shooting. And like, if it gets a few splashes on it or a little bit creased up or, you know, then it's well used and well loved. It, I want it to be like your little companion in the studio. So yeah, that's awesome. And then the last question that we have is, have you got another book idea in the pipeline? (laughs) Not right now. Um, Yeah, not yet. Never say never. I think if I was going to write another book, it would probably be on maybe one more focus topic rather than a general sort of covering of all the topics. So who knows in the future? Maybe. (laughs) <laughs> but not right now <laughs> not right now yeah for those who don't know you started this book in 2021 um, yeah after, and this was an undertaking mm-hmm. yeah writing a book is a long process it was super fun like it's a great process but it's definitely something that you need to set a chunk of time aside so at the moment I'm working on some new courses for food photography academy I want to get back into making YouTube videos more regularly. So I'm looking forward to doing that for a bit and then maybe consider another book in the future. Yeah. Now that you have it under your belt, you know that you can always come back to it. Exactly. Yeah. Well, Lauren, thank you so much for this presentation. Thank you so much for this amazing book. We're so happy to have it. Um, And thank you so much, audience, for your participation. Uh, This is going to be recorded. It'll be hosted on YouTube and it will be emailed to all who registered. So. Thank you so much and take care. Thank you.